you know, the baptistry was about jacuzzi temperature. <laughs> and so I got my body temperature up to like 115, you know, all these beef stew temperature. And I'm sweating out, cooling down, and I probably won't cool down until, what, November or so, but, <laughs> but it was all worth it. It was all worth it. So I'm going to invite Artemis to come up and join me. Come on up. We're all really, really, really proud of you today, and the choice that you've made, the choice that your mother and grandmother have made to raise you in Jesus. And uh, not only do we have a baptismal certificate for you, isn't that nice handwriting? I wish I had handwriting like that. I think that's Sharon, Miss Sharon's handwriting. And also some, uh, some Bible study guides for you to now maybe get deeper in the Lord and to know him even more. But also maybe you can share these with someone someday. And so church family, how many of you would like to welcome Miss Artemis into membership by waving at her, letting her know that you love her and care for her? And you have your first responsibility as a member of our church now. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. At the end of church, I'm going to ask you to walk out to the back doors with me and so that people can congratulate you in person. Can you do that? Uh-huh. Okay, good, good. So congratulations. We're very proud of you. Very proud of you. Amen. Oh Thank you, gosh. Artemis. Thank you so much. Very proud of you. Always a wonderful Sabbath when you get to see anybody uh, share their love for the Lord, but especially a young person. Amen. Amen. So today we're going to continue with our Journey Home series. This is uh, our series where we are looking at Christian history and comparing it with, uh, with the wilderness wanderings. They were on their journey home, right? The promised land. Are we on a journey home to the promised land? We have to keep focus in this day. As everyone's screaming about this and that, we have to stay focused. This world is not our home. We are just pilgrims here. We're sojourners. We're passing through, right, on our way to, to the Lord's home. We're going to be gathered with him in heaven. And I believe that day is coming soon, very soon. And so today, uh, it, it would be most helpful to you if you've watched our latest Golden Thread Ministries video uh, called To Row or Wade, if you were here in person or if you've watched it online, because there was so much information in that one that I had to cut quite a bit, and then I just really felt impressed to share more of it, and it fit perfectly into where we are in the Wilderness Wandering story, and so we're going to get to that today. But I'm going to invite you to pray with me, and then we're going to start our study. Heavenly Father, we've had so much to be grateful for today on this high Sabbath. We're so grateful for the young heart that was given to you, that was dedicated to you. And Lord, all of us now together in unity want to give our hearts and share our hearts with you. But we need you to speak to it. We want you to be our leader. We put you at the forefront of our hearts and minds. So we ask that you will lead us through these wilderness wanderings that we might come to a greater knowledge, a greater faith in you, Lord. And, uh, and Father, we want to see you more clearly today as we study. Help us do that. In Jesus' name, amen. So the, uh, the 15th century, the 1400s, the 15th century was a very notable time in world history. Lots of huge events took place in this, in this century, but also uh, some ways in Christian history and things that took, uh, played a role in Christian history. One of those events is the fall of Constantinople to the Ottoman Empire. Constantinople was the eastern uh, capital. It was the eastern side of the church. And this event, uh, actually the Ottoman Empire is so notable to, to Christian history that its fall in the 1800s, its fall is actually noted in Revelation as one of the prophecies. And so uh, the Ottoman Empire took control of Constantinople, modern day Istanbul, and that means it cut off the east from the west. Now, you may have heard that what this caused is that the Silk Road, the trade line from China to Europe, from the east to the west, was now cut off because the Silk Road ran right through uh, the Ottoman Empire now. 
And so it hurt the, uh, the economy of the West because they could no longer both receive and give of their goods to China and, and to the East. And so this is the common story you've heard about why this man decided to sail to the West from Spain. Christopher Columbus. If you had called him that, he would have said who? He would have looked around. He had no idea who Christopher Columbus was because he's Italian, and so his name was Cristoforo Colombo. Cristoforo Colombo. And that plays an important role. Remember that in just a minute. This is a part of the story. That it, from history is not a lie. It is simply, though, just a part of the story that he wanted to sail west because he was trying to establish a new trade route that didn't pass through the Ottoman Empire. But there's a whole lot more to the story, and it actually is a huge part of Christian history that is forgotten. So Cristoforo Colombo decided that he needed some funding for his trip. He believed that the trip to the Indies was only going to take about two weeks. But he needed funding. He actually had no ships. And he needed food and supplies and ships, so he needed funding. He asked people in Italy to fund him. They said no. He went to France. They said no. And then for six and a half years in Spain, he begged the queen, Queen Isabella, for funding. So Queen Isabella was the one he was asking because King Ferdinand was actually gone. He wasn't at home in the capital often because the 1400s was a time of upheaval in Spain. In fact, notice this map of 15th century Spain. It's one kingdom, but look how it's broken into all these other kingdoms. Delete the kingdom of Portugal. It has its own king, but all those other kingdoms are all part of Spain. And so Spain was fracturing at this time. And so King Ferdinand spent his reign out trying to unite the empire. But he didn't only want to unite the empire. He wanted to make the empire very Catholic, very Christian. He wanted to get rid of every one else. And so his wars were against people who were not Christian. You may know this because he expelled the Muslim people and the Jewish people. Get out of our kingdom. You see, the papacy was starting to fall apart. Now, this is just, you know, a few decades before the Protestant Reformation, but things are already starting to splinter. Things are starting to fall apart. And so Catholicism is losing its grip on Europe, and Spain saw themselves as the right hand. They wanted to be the ones to establish and to uphold Christianity. So get rid, they decided, of all Muslims and all Jewish people, the expulsion of them all. Well, this led... To a lot of them, a lot of Muslim people, a lot of Jewish people joining the church because they don't want to leave. They have homes, they have land, they have farms, they have family. They don't want to leave. So a lot of them began to join the church. But suddenly the church got worried because, well, wait a minute. What if all these people are just faking it? What if they're just pretend Christians? What if they're just taking it by name? And this caused the great Spanish Inquisition, in which thousands upon thousands of people were tortured in the name of Christ. Tortured in the name of Jesus. Are you really a Christian? I mean, how do you prove that while you're being tortured? Just mind-blowing the things that took place here. And so... As things began to heat up, Cristoforo Colombo went back to Queen Isabella and said, listen, I have a plan. I believe we can make Spain the right-hand man of the Pope, the right-hand kingdom, the one who upholds it. But we've got to put ourselves on the map. We've got to make ourselves proven. And so he set out with a plan, again, to go west to be a missionary. It wasn't just about finances of Europe. It was certainly about his personal finances, his personal glory. But he believed he was a missionary for the church. In fact, this was instilled in him from birth. His mom called him Christoforo because it means the bearer of Christ, the one who can carry Christ, 
the one who brings the news of God to the world around him. Now, at the very heart of this, to prove themselves, Spain, to prove themselves to the Pope, was to, uh, the, the way they wanted to do it was to connect Jerusalem with Rome again. Now, of course, look at this map for a moment. The Ottoman Empire there in modern-day Turkey is now standing between them. The, it's not just that the east is disconnected from the west, but Jerusalem, what they believed. Remember all the crusades that took place in the medieval era? They were constantly trying to establish Jerusalem as the capital. The reason is, in this time, they believed in an earthly millennial kingdom of Christ. They believed that Christ was going to return but that he was going to establish an earthly kingdom. Does Jesus specifically warn us about that belief? When he, he says, when you hear about me in the desert, what? Don't believe it. When you hear about me in the upper room, what? Don't go out. Don't search. Where are we going to meet him? In the air. And he says, where I am with the Father, there you may be also. But the church had the idea that Jesus was going to return and establish an earthly kingdom in Jerusalem. By the way, most Christians in America believe that still today. They are waiting for Christ to return to establish a kingdom on this earth. Someone is coming to establish that kingdom. It won't be Christ. It will be the angel of light that Jesus and Paul and so many others warned us about in Scripture. Right? Satan in disguise. But... They believed at this time that Jesus was going to establish an earthly kingdom in Jerusalem. Therefore, they weren't heading west in order to, combine, to connect China or Japan or Korea or the Indies with Spain. He was trying to find an alternate route around the Ottoman Empire to connect Europe with Jerusalem. Because they wanted to expel Anybody, the Muslims from Jerusalem, so that Jesus could come and set up his earthly kingdom. When he presented this plan to Ferdinand and Isabella, they said, wow, okay, we're in. We need Jerusalem. That will really get the Pope's attention. That will really get Rome's attention if we can establish a link between Jerusalem and Rome. So let's do it. I'm in. They funded his trip and he set out upon these three ships. Now, he is not the owner, he was not the owner of these ships. He rented these ships, and each ship had a captain, and each ship was owned by that captain. And in fact, Cristoforo Colombo writes about himself in the third person and calls himself the Admiral. He was the one who sat above the three ships, the three, uh, the three captains. He was the one in charge. And so, of course, we learn in American history, I'm sure you all know the names of these three ships, right? What are they? No. Their names are not the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria. Their names are Santa Clara, La Gallega, and Unknown. Its name was not unknown. It, was, it is unknown what its name was. Because these ships were owned by these captains, and it was the captain's boats, and they named them the Santa Clara, the La Gallega, which means the Galician, the kingdom of Galicia. So it was from Galicia, and then we're not sure the Pinta's original name uh, it is unknown now. It is lost to history. And so when they took command, the admiral took command of the three ships, Either, it was either, we're not sure who from history, but either himself or someone in his, in his stead who nicknamed them La Pinta, the, Santa, uh, the La Nina, and the Santa Maria. So these are nicknames of these ships because he saw himself as a missionary. He saw himself as the bearer of Christ. He wasn't going to sail around with the La Gallega. He was going to carry names that meant something. And uh, I've trans the translations of these are pretty interesting. La Penta means the painted one, the glorious one, the beautiful one, the venerated one, right? 
La niña means the little girl. The little girl. And what does Santa Maria mean? Holy Mary. Being a very strong Christian in that day, and I'm trying not to use the word Catholic because there aren't Catholics yet, right? They don't really know that name until the Protestant Reformation. There is just one church in the, 15, in the 1400s, right? And so uh, the Christ, he's going to carry the name of Christ. He's going to carry Christianity, and he wants to make sure that it is a blessed trip. That, it, that somebody from heaven is blessing him, and so they're going to nickname it, not after Christ, but after Mary. The glorious little girl, Holy Mary. And so it was that they believed, and we'll actually, you think I might be uh, making this up, we'll actually read from some Catholic writings in a bit to prove they believed that it was Mary who brought them to the Americas. We'll get back to that in a moment. And so the three ships set out. The Santa Maria, of course, being the, the flagship, the one that the admiral sailed on himself, was uh, the Santa Maria. It was Holy Mary who was carrying them across the ocean. I mentioned they thought it was going to be two weeks long, and so as they entered their second month, they began to really sweat and, and worry. They started to think, are we even going to make it? Are we going anywhere? Now listen, they, uh, you know, this is, this is nearing the winter, right? So who wants to be sailing in the winter? So they really, that shows, they really thought this was a short trip, that they'd be in and back before winter fell. But no. And it was on October 11th of 1492 when, a, when a, someone who was uh, watching at night yelled out, Land ahoy! And that person was on the La Pinta. It's interesting that the La Pinta suddenly seems to just go off on its own. It's not recorded in much of the writings. I don't even know, honestly, and I try to research this, I don't even know if the La Pinta made it back. I don't even know if it came back. Because suddenly they go from three ships after they've landed to two ships. Now it's just the little girl, Holy Mary, carrying them around. They land, of course, not in Virginia, not in Massachusetts. They land in what we call today the Bahamas, Right? In the Bahamas, and then they go from place to place to place, not only taking and stealing and enslaving, but also telling, hey, we're here. Can you imagine the, the mindset here? We're here to tell you of Christ, but we're also going to rape, pillage, steal, and enslave you. That's the mindset here. It's, it's wild. They end up making their way to what we call today, of course, the Dominican Republic in Haiti. This is Hispaniola. This is what he names it. But there is something interesting happens. On the north side of Hispaniola, the Santa Maria gets dug up in a sound sandbar. It gets stuck. Now, they could have easily tied it to the La Nina and, and pulled it back out. But at this point, the admiral hated the captain of the Santa Maria. And he wanted to leave uh, that captain behind. And so even though it's just in a sandbar, they decide to leave the Santa Maria and Christopher, Christopher Colombo and his crew get on the La Nina and they sail home only on the La Nina. Now notice the ironic, the irony of this and the, symbol, the symbolism of this. They come to bring Christ, but who do they leave behind? They leave Holy Mary behind. And in fact, they don't just leave it there on the sandbar. They demolish the ship. They take it apart and they reconstruct it on land. And the very first settlement of Europeans in the Americas is built from the timber of the Holy Mary. And so they came and they left and they left Mary behind. They were not bearers of Christ, but bearers of Holy Mary. Then, just under four decades later, 39 years later, remember, they've left Holy Mary behind. Something takes place. The first apparition of Mary, and we've talked about this in great detail, this is not the Virgin Mary, right? We are warned about the dead. They know nothing. They don't speak to us. But an apparition, a demonic apparition of Mary, takes place in Mexico to an indigenous person named Juan Diego. And we know this today, and it's, it's a phrase I'm sure you've heard as what? The Lady of Guadalupe. 
This is the moment of the Lady of Guadalupe. In fact, there are churches and places all over the nation named after the Lady of Guadalupe. Even here in town, there's the office. The, the Catholic office is called the Lady of Guadalupe Parish Office. So over a few months, Lady of Guadalupe begins to appear to Juan Diego and tell him the things that we hear at Fatima, the things that we hear, which is, draw to me and I will bring you salvation. Today, Catholic researchers believe that this was the, the appearing of the Lady of Guadalupe is because of Christopher Columbus. Notice this. It's from Catholic research here. They say this, even more interestingly, the flagship of Christopher Columbus's expedition to the New World, the Santa Maria, had a full name of Santa Maria de la Inmaculada Concepcion, meaning what? Holy Mary of the Immaculate Conception. We'll come back to that in a minute. Let me keep reading. The other ships, the Nina, little girl, and the Pinta, the painted one, foreshadows Our Lady of Guadalupe, the first Marian apparition in the New World, which would occur two centuries later. All right, let me correct the mistake. I don't know why they say two centuries later. It was 39 years later. I don't know what that comes from. But here, Catholic researchers, Catholic encyclopedias now say that it was because Christopher Columbus sailed on the Santa Maria and blessed the mission with her that she stayed behind and that she appeared to the indigenous people of Mexico. And she became the patroness of the Americas, the intercessor for the Americas. By the way, if you didn't grow up Catholic, you may not know what Immaculate Conception means. You may think that they're talking about uh, the, ba the, the conception of Jesus. No. They believe that she was immaculately conceived. That the Holy Spirit planted seed in her mother, St. Anne, and that Mary was saved from original sin, that she carried no sin, she had no sinful nature, and that she lived her entire life sinless without sin. And it is her conception that they say is the immaculate conception. Whose story does that sound like? It's Jesus, right? So they believe that it was because he brought Mary, because he left Mary behind, that she became a special goddess to the Americas. In fact, it continues. Notice this. The day that Columbus claimed the Americas for the Spanish crown. This is the day he landed on, in the Bahamas. October 12th, 1492, we call that Columbus Day, was a major Marian feast day in Spain. Our Lady of the Pilar. This title of Our Lady corresponds to the first ever Marian apparition which took place in Spain in 40 AD. So even the day he stepped foot on the Bahamas was a special day connected to a Marian apparition back in Spain. They believe that he set foot in the Bahamas on the anniversary of the very first time she ever appeared in Spain. Now I want you to understand something. In 40 AD, she's still alive. She's still living in Ephesus. They believe that she used some sort of out-of-body experience from Ephesus. She went into some trance, some vision, and teleported herself to Spain to appear to the indigenous people of Spain in 40 AD. And it just so happens, they're saying, it's, it's, they're saying it's providence that the day she did this in Spain, October 12th, is the exact day that he set foot in the Americas. Did you learn any of this in American history class? This is so important to know because it's prepping the world, right, for the, for the delusions and the deceptions of the end times. And so our whole hemisphere is, is found and discovered by Europe, not discovered in, in whole, but by Europe, all because they believe Christopher Columbus brought Mary to the Americas. And she is, to this day, actually a pa the patroness of all of these nations. The nations of the Western Hemisphere have all been given to her. In fact, we'll notice a little history here. Bishop Carroll, the first American bishop, chose the Virgin Mary as the patroness, 
the patroness of America's first diocese, Baltimore in 1791. Now this is important because you know of Bishop Carroll. You may not know that you know of Bishop Carroll, but if you've ever heard of Washington, D.C., you know of Bishop Carroll. Because at this time, they were trying to uh, pick a capital for the Americas, for the United States of America. And we learned this in our series that where did they end up putting it? At the heart of what two states? At the heart of Virginia and Maryland, the Virgin Mary. They put our capital at the heart of the Virgin Mary. It was his land that Washington, D.C. sits. He donated that land, those thousands of acres, he donated that to the federal government because he wanted the capital at the heart of the Virgin Mary, Virginia and Maryland. And so our nation's capital sits there because of his donation. And then he made the donation and he made her the, pa the patroness of America, I'm sorry, of Baltimore. But in 1846, our whole nation was given to Mary. The decree says this, with enthusiastic acclaim and with un, uh, unanimous approval and consent, the fathers have chosen the Blessed Virgin Mary, conceived without sin, right? There's the Immaculate Conception, as the patroness of the United States of America. I want you to notice the date. May 13. Is that important? It's the day Fatima begins, right? May 13. And we talked about how May is her month. We talked about how the number 13 is her number. They believe it to be her number. But outside of that, once you notice the year, is something happening in the Americas during the 1840s? This is when the truth is starting to grow. In 1844, a movement starts to take place, right? Of saying, we've been disappointed. We never want to be disappointed again. Let's study the word of God. We talk a lot about how, you know, as Adventism rises up in, in the 1840s, that Satan tried to uh, start up his other movements. We've got Jehovah's Witnesses. We have spiritualism and the Fox Sisters. We have Mormonism starting up around this time. But we lose sight that also Catholicism begins to grow in the Americas in the 1840s, including the donation of our nation to her in 1846. The declaration ends with this. The United States of America is indeed the land of Mary Immaculate. Our nation was given to her. We've all been prepped, right? The world, the nation is being prepped more and more for spiritualism. And these apparitions that Revelation 16 warns us will take place. This is all important to know to the wilderness wandering story that we're going to talk about today. Because what they've made, now this is not the Virgin Mary, but what they've made the Virgin Mary to be is actually the story of the golden calf. They've set her up as an idol for the world to venerate and to worship, to be given to. Now, something you want to, uh, need you to know about this golden calf. Did you know that the golden calf was female? In Exodus 32, the golden calf was female. Now you read through Exodus 32, you have no inkling there that it's a female. That it's not, in other words, it could be a bull, right? But this is a female calf. How do we know? Well, because they are coming out of Egypt. And in Egypt, there was a golden calf god. And it's the goddess Hathor. And Hathor is viewed at, at this time in Egypt as the queen of heaven. Is, does Mary have that title in Catholicism today? She is viewed as the mother of the Egyptians. Is that a synonymous term used today in Catholicism? The mother of the church? We talked about this a few weeks ago. She is viewed as the mother of the gods, that she gave birth to all the other gods. Is that synonymous with the teaching of Catholicism today? And so the golden calf, worship of the golden calf, has prolonged itself through Babylon, through Persia, through Greece, through Rome, and into the Christian era and the Christian church. We'll talk more about the golden calf here in a moment, but let's lift our eyes higher. There's the golden calf, in the valley at the base of Mount Sinai. But there's someone else who is up in the mountain interceding on Israel's behalf, right? Where's Moses during this moment? He is up on 
the mountain, receiving the law of God, right? He is communing with God, receiving the instructions of God, and he is interceding on behalf of Israel and God. He is not Christ, but he is a type of Christ in this story. And so this gives us good news for the end times. While deceptions run rampant, while so many turn their hearts to the things of Antichrist, where should our eyes be? On the mountain with Jesus, keeping our eyes, looking unto Jesus. You know that Moses is an interceder. He is, a, he, he is the intercession. He's practicing intercession on the mount. He is a mediator on the mountain. While he's up there, God knows what's taking place in the, in the valley, right? And I want you to notice in Exodus 32 what God says to Moses when he's breaking the news to him that the people have begun to worship this golden calf. Notice what God says. Exodus 32, verse 7. It says here, and the Lord said to Moses, go, get down. For what? Your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. Whose people? God says, your people. Now, is God divorcing himself from them? No, they've divorced him, themselves from him. They've said, we don't want to worship God. In fact, that's what the whole golden calf is about. They're worried that Moses has gone and disappeared. We'll talk about this in a few minutes. They're trying to replace Moses. It's an anti-Moses. It's an anti-Christ. And so because they've divorced themselves from God, what does God call them? Your people. He has distanced themselves from, him, from them, himself from them. But I love how Moses responds to this as a type of Christ in the story. God has divorced from the, he says, your people. But I want you to notice in verse 11 what Moses says in return. Then Moses pleaded with the Lord. Amen? Do we have someone in heaven pleading with the Lord? Our mediator, our intercessor, Jesus Christ? Then Moses pleaded with the Lord, his God, and said, Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against who? Your people whom, who? You have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand. No, Lord, they're not my people. They're still your people. In your great love, in your great care, I trust and I know you're going to find a way to forgive them. They are still your, Lord, be merciful to your people who are in error. Be merciful to your people who are now turning their back on you, who have divorced themselves from you. We talked about Hosea, right? In Sabbath school this morning, if you came to Sabbath school, you got an extra blessing of, of knowledge today as you studied the stories in, in our lesson. They're beautiful lesson, by the way. I hope you came to Sabbath school. Beautiful story of Hosea. Hosea's got a wife, and what does she do? She cheats on him. She becomes a harlot. And, but what does God tell him? Marry her again. Stay with her, right? So this is, this is that moment. God, Moses is like, no, Lord, they're not my people. They're your people. He is interceding on their behalf. Family, don't forget that in your struggles, in your trials, even in your sins, and we don't want sin, but even in your sins, you have a mediator in heaven. Amen? We have an advocate with the Father who says, Lord, they're still your people. Turn your loving care to them. Give them forgiveness. Lord, look. Look upon them with love and compassion. And so we have in the valley a beast. It's not a real animal. It's an image to the beast, is it not? Down at the base of Mount Sinai. Listen, what we're going to learn over the next few minutes, I want you to know this. There, is, there are many stories in the Bible that foreshadow the end times. There is no story in Scripture more clear and more adamantly a foreshadowing of the end time events than the story of the golden calf. I mean, it's almost as if you're reading right out of Revelation 13 when you read Exodus chapter 32. Because down at the base of the mountain of God... The people of God have turned their backs on God and they are worshiping an image to the beast. And remember that as Moses starts to come down the mountain, 
What does Joshua say to him? What do they hear? They hear them praising. They hear them singing. It sounds like war in the camp, but they're actually singing and praising this mighty image of the beast. Does this take place in Revelation chapter 13, the great mark of the beast chapter, the end times chapter of Revelation? Are they marveling after the beast? Notice Revelation chapter 13, verse 4. Speaking of the world outside of those who stay loyal to God, everyone else. So they worship the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worship the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make what? War with him. Isn't that interesting that they're praising the beast that, and it sounds like war, right? No one can make war with this. And what does Joshua say? It sounds like war in the camp. All these connections between the two. They're marveling after the beast in the end times, in the image of the beast. Notice what great controversy tells us because we have, we have the answer we need in the time of deception. This great book says this on page 524. Disguised as an angel of light, Satan, that's he, spreads his nets where least suspected. If men would but study what? The book of God. With earnest prayer that they might understand it, they would not be left in darkness to receive false doctrines. But as they reject the truth, they fall a prey to deception. Do we have what we need to stand firm in the day of trial? Moses is where in the story of Exodus 32? He's receiving what? The law of God, the word of God. Who wrote the law? God's own finger on stone, right? He's on the mountain receiving the word of God, the law of God. And in the end times, it is, there is one thing that will keep us connected to truth. And that is what the pastor says. No. Thank you. Some of you are falling asleep, maybe. It's what the word of God says. Amen? The Bible is our surety. It is our assurance. It is what keeps our eyes upon Jesus. Amen? If we look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, well, how do I look upon Jesus? Is it because we paint, should we paint him up here and stare at it? It's because we look at the word of God. The Bible is our assurance. So as the deceptions go out, as the angels of lights, the apostles begin to appear, and the work of Satan and the spirits of the dead, as he starts to con confuse the world, those who love God will stand upon the word of God. What did Jesus stand upon in the wilderness of temptation? Three words. What were they? It is written. Moses was bringing the law to the people. Wouldn't that law have kept them from sin? Lord, I write your word in my heart that I may not be led into sin, right? Let's keep reading back in this story. Exodus 32, and Aaron said to them, break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people broke off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. The people were giving an offering, but it wasn't for the Lord. It was for the world. I want us all, myself included, I want us all to think about how we spend our money and, and to who are we giving our money to? Who are we, where are we spending our time? And what are things are we spending our attention? We're so eager and so willing to give up of our money and our time and our energies for the things of this world. That's what they're doing. But we should be giving these things up for who? For the Lord. They're so eager here. These people complained about everything that Moses directed them to do. They murmured and complained constantly. But Aaron says, okay, break off your earrings so I can make this calf. They're instantly all in. Instantly all in. We're so quick to want to give to the things of this world. But it continues. And he received the gold from their hand. And he fashioned it with an engraving tool and made a golden calf. Then they said, this is your God, O Israel, that, you, that brought you out 
of the land of Egypt. Were they brought out of Egypt? Yeah. Were they brought out by a great hand? Absolutely. Were they brought out by a god? Was it Hathor, the Egyptian goddess, the queen of heaven? This is the worship going on today. We so many now believe that Mary is the one interceding on our behalf, that Mary is the one who's our mediator in heaven, that she's the one doing all these things. This is just the doctrine of the golden calf. Jesus is the one who brought them out of Egypt. It is by his outstretched arms on the cross that he saved us from sin. Amen. And so he receives their gold uh, and then he fashions it with an engraving. He fashions it, he makes it, he molds it, he engraves it. Now I don't have this slide in here, but when Moses comes down off the mountain, he says, Aaron, what have you done? And I'm paraphrasing. You know what Aaron says? I don't know. I took their gold and I threw it in the fire and poof, this calf came out. I'm paraphrasing, but read it in the story in Exodus 32. He goes, he goes I threw it in the fire and this calf came out. No, no. Too often we try to save ourselves and hide our sin. Family, don't hide your sin. Take it to Jesus. Repent and confess your sins because you are his people. He loves you and he'll forgive you. He molded, he shaped it, he engraved it, he fashioned it. He created an image to the beast. Notice Revelation 13, 14 again. Speaking about the powers that be in the end times. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs. That's the angel of light stuff, the miracles, the signs and wonders. He deceives the world, which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast. Telling those who dwell on the earth to what? To make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. Exodus 32. Do they mold and shape an image to the beast? In Revelation 13, do they mold and engrave and shape and fashion an image to the beast? Got all these major connections. Now, if you haven't studied prophecy with us, we have a wonderful lesson online called National Treasure. I would love to study it with you. If you haven't studied prophecy yet, you might be surprised to know that the Bible is very clear in Revelation 13 what this image to the beast is. There is one thing that the church says proves its authority, that proves it is God's people. It proves that, uh, that it is the power that God has invested in this world, and that is the keeping of Sunday. And at this time, they will enforce, the world will enforce a law that everyone has to go to church on Sunday. Please, if you don't know what I'm talking about, let's study prophecy together. It's very clear here. But we're looking at these connections. That's why it's important to bring this up. Because did you know that even in the story of the Exodus, I'm sorry, the story of the golden calf in Exodus, he anoints a day, a forced day of worship. So he engraves the calf. He molds it. He fashions it. He puts it in the, in the, in the fire and it comes out. Did you know they didn't start worshiping it right away? He brings the calf out, he presents it before the people, and he doesn't say, yay, it's here, let's worship it. Notice what he says. Exodus 32, verse 5 and 6. So Aaron saw it, right, he finished it. He built an altar before it, and Aaron made a what? A proclamation, a decree. When a nation makes a decree, what do we call that today? A law. And said what? Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. Then they rose early on the next day, offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. That Hebrew word play there, by the way, means a drunken, drunken revelry. So this wasn't just like they were playing chess. This is sensual, this is sexual, this is very disgusting, this is uh, flagrant sin against God as they're just drunkenly performing all kinds of Egyptian rites and, and, and things there at the base of Mount Sinai. Why not, just make the, why not just worship it right when it came out? Because it's a parallel to last day events. They weren't just going to do it all day, all the time. There was going to be a special day of worship 
Not on God's day. Not God's word. Not according, but according to whose word? The traditions of man. According to Aaron, who has now set himself up in the place of Christ. Right? He's the priest now of this calf. He's the one on earth who is now establishing the worship of this calf. He's making the rules. It's according to his commandments and his traditions. And he says, nope, we're not going to do it today. We're going to do this tomorrow. Everyone has to come back. And it's a feast unto the Lord. I, I don't have any proof of that, but I, 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 there is nothing. I looked. If you didn't hear, uh, Sister Maria, I believe that the law was given to Moses on the Sabbath. It just makes logical sense. There is no biblical proof for that or, or writings of Ellen White to prove that. But I think it makes a lot of sense that he went up on the mountain to commune with the Lord over those 40 days and that he received the law from God on the Sabbath, which would make this feast win. Sunday. I don't know that, though. It's only a hypothesis. I have no idea, and there's no proof of that. But regardless of the day, he anoints a day. And it's a feast to who? It's a feast to? Tomorrow is a feast. Yeah, you're saying it the right way. It's a feast to the calf, but they claim it's what? A feast to the Lord. You can call it a feast to the Lord all you want. It doesn't make it a feast to the Lord. Abraham Lincoln, who was a pretty smart guy, he once said, I want to make sure I say this correctly. He once said, what do you call a dog with five legs? You call it a dog, right? No, it, it can change, but it's still a dog, right? They can call it a, a feast to the Lord, but it doesn't mean it's a feast to the Lord, right? You can change things. It doesn't make it a feast to the Lord. It is a feast to himself because he has established himself as the high priest of this golden calf. And he says, tomorrow is a feast to the Lord, but it doesn't make it to the Lord. It's a feast to the golden calf. Why did they want this calf? Patriarchs and Prophets says this, page 316. They desired, the people desired some image to represent God and to go before them where? In the place of Moses. That's an important phrase, in the place of. Does anyone remember how to say that in Greek, in the place of? Anti. This is an anti-Moses. And in the last days, we have an anti-Christ. An anti-Christ isn't, doesn't mean against Christ. It is against Christ, but it doesn't mean against Christ. It means what? A substitute Christ, in place of Christ. And so they have set up this golden calf, the worship, what we call today, the veneration of Mary. They've set up this golden calf to be in the place of Moses. But in the story, Moses is a type of Christ. So this golden calf, which has a day to worship, a specific lawful day, a proclamation. It is proclaimed that will be worshipped on this day. And it is in place of Christ. But again, we have a gospel in the story. Moses doesn't only intercede for them on, on their behalf on the mountain. He comes down off the mountain with a very special invitation, family. Because it's the invitation you and I now are supposed to be giving to the world. Notice what he says. He comes off the mountain. Exodus thirty two twenty six. Then Moses stood in the entrance of the camp and said... Whoever is on the Lord's side, what? Come to me. It's an invitation. Follow the Lord. Come out of her, my people. Whoever is on the Lord's side, come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together to him. Who were the Levites? The priests. Are we all now priests unto God? And so the saints of God are called out. There's a judgment here. There's now going to be a dividing line between those who choose Christ or Antichrist, right? There's now going to be, that's it. There's no more, there's not 10 camps, 15 camps. Right now in this world, there's 100 different camps we can be in. But there's coming a time when there will only be two camps, Christ or Antichrist. This is the moment. Moses comes down and says, okay, line in the sand, that's it. Everybody decide, are you for Christ or Antichrist? 
He says, come to me. He's a type of Christ. Does Jesus say, come to me? Matthew 11, come to me. There's a dividing line. And those who love the Lord, the priests of God, say, Thou, whew, whew. where were they before this? Were they worshiping? I don't know. There's no context here to believe that they're worshiping. But where are they? They're in the midst of darkness in Babylon. Are we now in the midst of darkness in Babylon? Are we in the midst of this world in the darkness, right? But there's coming a time when Jesus will say, come away, come out of her. Are there many now? In fact, maybe we could say the, the, us, though we live in this world, we've already come out of her. We've come out of her. But are there many other people in the world today who still need to come out of the traditions of men? And who is the one who makes that invitation? The church on behalf of Jesus, says, come out of her, my people. Notice, Revelation 18, more connections between last day events and this story. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, who? Isn't that beautiful? We start the story with it, your people, and we end the story in the prophecy, and God calls them what? My people. Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, lest you receive of her plagues. And it's at this time in, in our near future when at the whole world decides Christ or Antichrist and what happens, what falls upon those who choose Antichrist. Do plagues fall upon them? And so anyone who rejects the invitation of Christ has plagues that fall upon them according to Revelation chapter 17. In the story of Exodus 32, do plagues fall on those who don't come to Moses? Exodus 32, 35, so the Lord plagued the people because of what they did with the calf which Aaron made. You know, Aaron can deny it. He did deny it. I didn't make it. I just threw the gold in and it, poof, this, this calf came out. But the Lord, I'm sorry, the word, the Lord, but the word has inscribed it in history. Aaron did it. His sin is recorded. Are our sins recorded? We need the forgiveness of Jesus. Don't hide them. Bring them to the Lord. The Lord plagued the people. You know, when you read through Exodus 32, you are reading a timeline of last day events. We have a golden calf being built right now in our hearing, in, in this world, in America. More and more, Mary's being venerated. Mary's going to save us. Mary's going to help us. This golden calf is being molded and shaped. This image to the beast. And there will be a day when they say, okay, we have to worship this unto the Lord. It won't be the Lord, though. And they'll establish a day of forced worship. And then the church will have that one last decree of saying, hey, everyone, this is it. This is the drawing line right here. Come on, come to Christ. This is why. Read the word. This is what it's going on. This is what's going to happen. Come out of her, my people. And then everyone will decide one way or another. And probation will close at that point. And when probation closes, when everyone's decided, plagues fall upon the wicked. In both stories, Exodus 32 is a timeline of last day events. But... What have we learned? There's one path to truth in this time in which we live. The word of God. Follow it. Follow the truth. And we will be set free from all of it at the end. We will be safe through the storm, safe through the trial. We will not look upon the deceptions. We will not be fooled if we stay true to the word of God. Of God. Let's end here in Colossians 3.16. Let the word of Christ dwell where? In you. I want you to say that personally. In where? In me. Let the word of Christ dwell in me richly. In all wisdom. Do we need wisdom in this day and age? Can I make a quick side note? We, a lot of us, you know, when COVID started going around and all these laws, not laws, but these proclamations and local decrees and this is what people need to do and you have to wear this and do this and do this. Listen, we're seeing this happen again, right? Doesn't Jesus warn us about pandemics in the last days? What's spreading right now? Monkeypox is spreading quickly, right? What are we going to do? Are we going to get together like we did with COVID and fight about it? 
I don't know if you personally did that, but I know a lot of churches. That got together, and they fought and fought and fought and fought about what they're going to do. We need the word of God to lead us because it will give us the wisdom we need. And in these times, it's not so much about what we need to do. It's about who we can reach for Jesus in these times. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. I need wisdom. You need wisdom in these days. Teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. You know what he's saying? That in the last days, in his day and in the last days, everything, our hearts, our minds, our words, everything needs to be focused on the word of God. We need to sing it in our hearts and sing it out loud. We need to, right? It's both internal and external. Singing with grace where? In your heart. So we're internally all about Jesus. Focus on Jesus. Focus, focus, focus. And externally, he says, teaching and admonishing one another. Right? So internally, we're going to be filled with Jesus and his word. And it's going to come out of us like a fountain bubbling over to the world around us. We have our mission before us. Personally stay focused on Jesus and teach others to stay focused on Jesus. And none will be lost for who stands with the Lord. Let us pray. Father, I thank you so much for this story from Exodus 32 that gives us a timeline of revelation. We can look back at it and see the journey that has been taken and understand the journey that we will be taking here shortly. But Father, today, help us to hear the call. Help us to hear the invitation that whoever is with Christ to come to Christ. And then help us, Lord, to take that invitation to the world around us. There are others who need to hear that invitation, Lord. Will you please bring them into our, into our, uh, into our neighborhoods, into our conversations, into our sight this week? Give us those inspired moments where we can let someone know that you are a God who's inviting them to safety in these unsure times. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let us